The history of math is our intellectual foundation to understanding science. Science. Beautiful, awesome, wonderful science. It's the creative foundation to our ineffable future. Hi, I'm Gabrielle Burchak, and this is my podcast, Math, Science, History. I often promote my website, mathsciencehistory.com, which I built myself. Of all the hosts that I've been with, my experience with Bluehost has been the best. What I really like about Bluehost is their customer service. It is top notch and they are always there to help me. So if you're looking to build a website or you're looking to move to a new host, I highly recommend Bluehost. You can access Bluehost through my affiliate link, which is www.bluehost.com com slash track t-r-a-c-k slash math science history all one word bluehost is fantastic and they are affordable it's only $3.95 a month if you sign up for 36 months so if you do the math it's $142 to start and for me it was the smartest business investment I've ever made This Friday is June 19th, also known as Juneteenth, and it is known as Emancipation Day. It commemorates the day when Union General Gordon Granger emancipated the last of the remaining slaves in 1865. And even though African Americans have been emancipated in 1865, the road before them has been nothing but challenging, even today, as we march for the Black Lives Matter movement. And black lives do matter. Statistically, today, African Americans are three times more likely to be murdered by police than white people. And even though African Americans consist of 13% of the U.S. population, they account for 24% of deaths by police. Then there are the hate crimes. Again, even though African Americans consist of 13% of the United States population, 28% of hate crimes are directed towards black people. And such was the case in the Illinois suburb of Oak Park. The event happened on the day before Thanksgiving. Oak Park, known as Saints Rest because there's so many churches on the area, was an exclusive area where residents often joined clubs and formed enclaves of friendly communities. It was considered home of many famous individuals, including fiction writer Edgar Rice Burroughs, dancer Doris Humphrey, and the brilliant American journalist Ernest Hemingway. Then on the evening of November 22, 1950, arsonists broke into to an empty, newly purchased home. They splashed gasoline on the walls and the floors of the 15 rooms within this house. Then they tossed a kerosene torch through the porch window, setting the house ablaze. A neighbor heard the commotion and looked outside to see two men driving away in a dark sedan. And why would something like this happen in Oak Park? The answer was racism. Shortly before the house was set on fire, the house had been purchased by Dr. Percy LaVon Julian. Percy Julian was born on April 11, 1899 in Montgomery, Alabama. He was the grandson of a former slave. His grandfather had two of his fingers cut off as punishment for learning how to write. So racism and discrimination was evident in his life from the day he was born. And he even said that one of his earliest memories occurred when he was walking in the woods near his home when he found a lynched black man hanging from a tree. That's pretty traumatizing for a young child. His mom, Elizabeth, was a school teacher and his father, James, was a railway service clerk. And even though James was passionate about education, he never had the opportunity to attend college. When Percy's father completed eighth grade, James' teacher, Joan Stewart, offered him a chance to go to college at DePauw University in Greencastle, Indiana. However, James turned it down because he had a family to take care of. And so, like his father, James, Percy attended school up to the eighth grade, but he could not go on to high school because there weren't any high schools in his neighborhood that accepted black students. And this was just one of many reminders that he would always be judged by the color of his skin. His parents urged him and pushed him, as well as his five other siblings, to attend school and pursue a higher education. So, 
He attended two years at Lincoln National School, which was a teacher's college and one of the first universities open to African Americans. Once Percy completed his high school courses, Joan Stewart reached out to James and offered Percy a chance to study at DePauw University. When James and Percy said yes to the offer, Joan reached out to her friend, Julian DePew Hogate, a local newspaper editor who pulled a few strings to get Percy into DePauw University. And so Percy boarded a train and made a trek of 571 miles north to attend DePauw University. When his train arrived in Greencastle, he was greeted by Julian's son, Kenneth, who stood on the platform with a smile and an outstretched hand. Percy said that Kenneth's hand was the first white hand he had ever shook. Kenneth helped Percy get situated at DePaul University, and that was the beginning of a long academic career that Percy would undertake. After his first year at DePaul University, the rest of his family moved to Greencastle so that the rest of his siblings could also attend DePaul. In 1920, Julian graduated with the highest honors and the highest grades, and he had been elected to Phi Beta Kappa. However, even with these phenomenal grades, he could not get an assistantship, a fellowship, or even be admitted into graduate school. He found a position teaching chemistry at Fisk University, and then after two years, he won a fellowship to go to Harvard University. There, he earned his master's degree. However, his opportunities for a PhD were not available, so instead, he taught at West Virginia State College and Howard University, where he eventually became the head of the chemistry department. Still, Even after receiving high grades and accolades, he still could not get accepted into a U.S. university to get his Ph.D. So he set his sights outside the U.S. where he earned a Rockefeller Foundation grant and went to the University of Vienna where he received his doctorate in chemistry. Well, in Europe, he enjoyed the freedom from racism and spent his time going to the opera and social gatherings. And when he received his Ph.D. in chemistry, he was one of the first three African Americans to do so. In 1936, he obtained the position of director of research at the Glidden Company for two reasons. One, because he was a brilliant chemist, and two, because he spoke German and Glidden had just purchased a plant from Germany. So at Glidden, he designed and supervised the world's first plant for the production of industrial-grade isolated soy protein from oil-free soybean meal. His work was tremendous. He completed the total synthesis of physostigmine, which is used to treat glaucoma and reverse neuromuscular blocking. He also extracted stigmasterol, which helps to lower cholesterol and, when isolated from soybean oil, can be converted into progesterone. Not only did he pioneer the chemical synthesis of cortisone, but he also pioneered the chemical synthesis of steroids and birth control pills. While at Glidden, he invented and patented a foam technique that isolated and synthesized progesterone, estrogen, and testosterone. In 1949, he found a way to create cortisone on a large scale and eliminated the use of osmium tetroxide, which was an expensive chemical used for the process. He ended up saving Glidden a lot of money, which made him a bit of a hero, corporately speaking. Percy, in his lifetime, went on to obtain 100 patents and have his work published in over 160 publications. However, regardless of his fame and accolades, he was still the subject of racism and discrimination. While working at Glidden, he purchased a home in Oak Park, and before he had even moved in, the day before Thanksgiving on November 22nd, some of the neighbors made it perfectly clear that he was not welcome by throwing a firebomb in his house. And this was even 11 months after Percy had been given the Chicagoan of the Year Award by the Chicago Sun-Times. This became a bit of a PR debacle for Oak Park. They wanted to be known for their progressive community, so they tried to bury the story. But Time Magazine picked up the story and exposed the racism that was directed at Dr. Percy Levon. Julian in Oak Park. The police department refused to protect him, and so Percy had to hire private guards. As a result, Percy had to explain to his family that there were people in the neighborhood who did not want them there, as he and his son took up guard in a tree, shotgun at the ready. This was even after he had been awarded five honorary doctorate degrees. 
Yet, he persevered. He continually pursued a life that society told him he couldn't pursue. He never gave up. And, like that river that cuts through a rock, not because it's powerful, but because it's persistent, Percy persisted and accomplished so much in his lifetime. In his lifetime, he earned 18 honorary doctorates and one more posthumously. He earned over 18 academic and civic honors and was a member, laureate, and fellow to over eight societies. In 1973, he was elected into the National Academy of Sciences, and in 1990, after his passing, he was elected into the National Inventors Hall of Fame. His accomplishments were exceptionally numerous. America's black community has contributed so much to the advancement of our country's science. So, even though, yes, all lives do matter, right now, nothing matters more than our black communities. To ignore this would be equivalent to going to the doctor with a broken arm and having the doctor say, well, all bones matter, and he looks at all of the bones on your body except for your broken arm. Right now, we need to address what's broken, and right now, we need to fix this broken thing in our country so that we can fully heal and move forward with respect, love, and acceptance for our black brothers and sisters. Otherwise, we will remain stuck in the past with an antiquated mindset, and we will never move forward. We will always be broken. Black lives matter. Black lives matter today, yesterday, and have mattered for the last 400 years in the U.S. Black lives matter. Percy Julian is just one of the many brilliant scientists who have done so much for our country and our country's advancements in science. George Washington Carver, Benjamin Banneker, Garrett Morgan, Madam C.J. Walker, Lewis Howard Latimer, Elijah McCoy, Granville Woods, Thomas Jennings, Frederick McKinley Jones, Otis Boykin, Norbert Rilieu, Ian Ernst Matzliger, Emmett Chappelle, Sarah Good, Sarah Boone, Bessie Blount Griffin, Henry Blair, Miriam Benjamin, David Crosswaite, Marjorie Joyner, Lloyd Hall, Ben Montgomery, Andrew Jackson Beard, Benjamin Bradley, Henry Cecil McBay, Louis Temple, Leonard Bailey, Rebecca Cole, Edward Alexander Boucher, Daniel Hale Williams, Charles Henry Turner, Ernst Everett Joost, Archibald Alexander, Roger Arliner Young, Charles Richard Drew, Katherine Johnson, Mary Edward Chin, Lillian Burwell Lewis, Marie Maynard Daly, and the list goes on and on and on and on. Without these brilliant black individuals and many more, our developments in science would not have evolved to where it is today. Could you imagine the progress in science we could make as a country if we all were just truly colorblind? I'm Gabrielle Burchak. This podcast has been brought to you by Caffeine. Delicious, wonderful, nectar of the gods caffeine. Coffee, tea, coffee candy, you name it. I love it. Thank you for listening to Math Science History. If you like what you are listening to, please remember to subscribe and leave a review. I would really appreciate that. If you are interested in reading more about the history of math and science, please come visit me at mathsciencehistory.com. And while you are there, if you like what you're listening to, please feel free to click on that coffee button and buy me a cup of coffee. Until next week, carpe diem.